I'm Steve Prichniewski. I'm a tech market engineer on the Storage Grid team. And we're going to talk a little bit about the architecture of Storage Grid and show how it makes this flexibility possible. So Storage Grid has a very simple architecture. All of the nodes by <coughs> default speak the S3 API. So here I'm simply putting my storage nodes that I'm representing in what looked like orange on my laptop, but kind of a pale salmon here on this display. And then I've also got admin nodes. So in every site, I need to have a minimum of three storage nodes, but we support asymmetrical architectures. So in this case, I've got six nodes in site A. I may want more nodes in a site for higher performance, or I may want more nodes in a site because that's a low cost site and it's gonna make sense for me to store more there. So think about, again, we have more nodes in Oregon and North Carolina <coughs> than we do in Sunnyvale. Um, so that ability to have asymmetrical architectures makes that possible. So we have multiple applications all talking into, into Storage Grid. Uh, we have kind of a service provider model where they're isolated by default. Um, we also speak the Swift API, although we frankly have not seen a lot of adoption around that. And then to support NFS and SMB, we have our NAS Bridge VM. So that's uh, optimized for archive workloads. Um, it's no extra cost. You can deploy as many as you want. And then you have the ability to write things in by NFS and SMB and then to retrieve them uh, by S3 for file object duality. So kind of a deep dive into the storage nodes. The storage nodes are the heavy lifters of the grid, right? They literally do everything. In fact, you can turn the admin nodes off and storage grid will keep running just fine, right? As long as you don't want to make any changes to the system, you don't need the admin nodes. They're completely out of the data path. So the storage nodes manage the metadata. As I ingest metadata, we, that's automatically managed for you. We make copies of that at every site. We also manage the storage. Of course, it says metadata, metadata. What am I supposed to say storage? Um, we manage the storage under that system, whether that's disk or SSD or out on the cloud, we manage that storage. Um, and then we've got that policy engine. So we've created those set of rules as we ingest the objects. The, the storage node is ingesting that object saying, hey, this one's tagged for the EU, I need to store it in Germany, or this one's over 10 megs in size, I'm gonna go ahead and erasure code it. So these apply it. They're also doing that continual health check of the objects, making sure that they're in compliance. You said um, that obviously people treat this as one enormous grid, hence the name, yes, I suppose. They can. So what happens if um, I'm sitting in the UK mm -hmm. and for some crazy reason, the data I'm writing has to be stored in Germany? I'll show you that. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I'm, actually, I'm going to do the exact demo at the end. Okay. Yep. I'll show up. So again, we need a minimum of three of storage nodes because of the way we store metadata. And again, this is supposed to be storage here. So ah, I was supposed to come back and tweak that during lunch. But <laughs> So what do the admin nodes do, right? So the admin nodes are your tenant portal, right? They present the web UI for you to interact with it. It's where you log in, create users, create policies, create groups. Um, you create your grid, your grid configuration. So if I need to expand the grid or decommission a node, it's all done through the admin node. This is where you create those policies. And again, so essentially you create the configurations on the admin node, they're then pushed out to the storage nodes and the storage nodes implement them. The other thing the admin nodes do is audit. So every action that happens in the system, we keep a very granular audit log. You can tune that down if you want, but every put, every get, every head, uh, we, we keep that in there for tracking. You can then run analytics against it. So a lot of our customers will run Splunk against that audit log or uh, Elk log stash. We actually out on GitHub have some examples of how to parse that audit log and do cool things with it. We're also collecting all the metrics for the system within storage, within the admin node. So we're running Prometheus. Um, so everything we do, all the graphs and charts are all done with Grafana and Prometheus. And that also means that if you want to extract these out into a big dashboard, so we see this at a lot of service providers where they've got you know, in the knock a bunch of applications they're looking at, they're pulling out key metrics from storage grid and putting them up on that big screen so they can monitor them. Are you planning to integrate uh, storage grid with uh, Active IQ? Yes, so we are planning to do more with that. Um, so again, you can, you can actually look at our UI and then look at those Grafana charts and say, hey, I want to steal that query and then put it in something else and then and do that as well. Um, it also contains the load balancer service. So the admin node contains the load balancer service to allow us to create that HA group for the admin node. And again, you know, same as, as the load balancer node. So you can, you can deploy the load balancer on the admin node, you're gonna have multiple admin nodes, and then if you need more for more throughput, more connections, you can deploy more instances of just the load balancer. So how do we support multiple platforms? So on this, we're showing kind of in the dashes all the things that we give you. So under the covers, whether you deploy on our hardware, 
on VMware or on software only, it's the same animal under the covers, right? We always deploy storage grid into containers and then we put them out there. So if you're doing you know, the appliance, it's ready to go. You rack and stack it, give it the IP and, and you're done. If you're doing VMware, you're gonna provide that VMware infrastructure. Um, we provide an OVF tool, uh, bash script to automate this. And then if you're doing uh, software only, you're gonna install your OS, you're gonna install Docker, and then you're gonna install you know, the storage grid images inside that. <coughs> so once these are up and running though, they're all managed the same common management and API set. So even though they're completely different platforms, once you log into the UI, they all appear to be the same, right? You can, you can tell which is which, but they're managed the same, they behave the same, and you're able to treat them all the same. So let's talk about how we do data protection. Uh, we're doing what we're calling layered erasure coding. So on our appliance, we're doing what's called DDP, right? And it's a feature of E-Series, as you mentioned before. You know, this is E-Series under the covers. Um, but the way it works is when I want to erasure code an object, I'm protecting it at the software level, and I'm also then protecting it again at the hardware level. <coughs> so here I'm protecting my object with a six plus three scheme across three sites. I'm putting every single chunk on a unique storage node, so I'm protecting it at that level, and then within those storage nodes, I'm then protecting them with that node level erasure coding. So depending on the number of disks I have in my appliance, I can have an eight plus two or a 16 plus two erasure coding scheme based on that. And the idea here is that we have a better level of resilience. We're able to do more efficient software schemes because we've got that additional level of protection underneath. So with a lot of other vendors, they're using JBOD solutions. Disk failures are very common. And when a disk fails, they have to rebuild that disk. So that's gonna require me to pool a lot of information across the network. And that'll typically also consume a lot of compute resources. So with object storage, performance, you know, high performance is important, but just as important is really consistent performance. So if you have a, a dip in performance every time a disk <coughs> fails, that can be unacceptable. So we've actually had you know, some, a large telco come in, have us you know, build a large grid, age it up with you know, a lot of data, billions of objects, and then come in and start yanking drives and failing things to prove that we have consistent performance. <coughs> so the other thing I wanna call out is our service provider model. So, and we actually are you know, being utilized by service providers to present S3 as a service to the public. So we've got the grid administrator that controls the infrastructure, creates the data management policies, kind of creates that service catalog for the storage users to consume. They'll create those tenants, but that grid administrator does not have any access to the tenants' data. So what I'm trying to illustrate in this design here is that the grid administrator controls the tenants, but then the tenants have complete isolation and protection of their data. So when I create a tenant, you know, so for instance, it could be my engineering department if it's an internal customer, or again, it could be a, a, an, external, an external customer, they effectively become their own administrator. That first administrator within the tenant can then create sub-users, create groups, apply policies, and effectively act as their own storage admin. So here's an idea of a geo-distributed grid. The idea here, I've got multiple sites, New York, UK, and Hong Kong, and I'm creating this single S3 endpoint that I can then globally load balance all of it. So that's kind of the high level, you know, basic thing you'd expect people to do. You can also create individual URLs. So I could create uh, you know, s3.ny.com or s3.uk.com if I wanted to let my customers write into a specific site. So I think this kind of leads about what Chris was talking about. So if I want to put you know, all of my flash into one area to ensure that my you know, high performance data lands on flash, gets read from flash, what I can actually do is create a logical site. So these could be within the same data center, they could be separate, but the idea would be here that I'm gonna present maybe a URL of s3flash.company.com, and then those high performance workloads are gonna land on flash, be serviced on flash, and then I can even set one of my ILM policies later on to say, if no one's touched an object for 60 days, go ahead and pull it back here. The metadata will still live on flash, but the object data can get pulled down to another tier of storage. So they'll have that fast response and then you can pull it back and re-promote it if you need have to. Have you provided the option to, um, to run this on HCI? We do work with HCI. We've done a couple uh, deployments. So the idea that you would deploy your, your compute on HCI, maybe even pin some of the metadata on HCI and then present like an E-series chassis underneath it. So we have done some deployments like that. Um, I, and I mean, I was meaning your, you know, your own HCI product. <clears throat> So it would be like, I could literally, we've talked about that. That's, that's been a, a, a discussion. So where that, the HCI deployment tool would say, and now deploy storage grid. Yeah. We, yes, that is something we are considering. Okay. 
So this is an interesting story, right? So we have uh, this customer here that I think really illustrates the flexibility of the product. So the customer, I think, had an archive workload in mind when they bought Storage Grid. They bought three of the 60 drive appliances. So, you know, kind of archive optimized. And then what it turns out they had was a high performance, small object delete workload. So what they were doing was ingesting millions and millions of objects every day. They wanted to hold those objects for 30 days. And on the 30th day, they were required by whatever regulation they were under to delete all those objects within 30 days. And what we found is we were not completing it. So we had to do a little math for them. And we came back and said, you know what, you actually need seven nodes to do that. They had plenty of, of, of empty space on these big, fat, you know, dense archive drives, but they didn't have enough compute to handle it. So what we were able to do was deploy four more VMs in VMware. So these are controlling metadata as well, and we were able to meet their delete performance requirement by doing this. Um, as they expanded in the future, when they finally did start consuming all the space here, they went with the 12 drive appliances. But just an idea of how flexible this can be, right? So it's really hard to make a bad decision or paint yourself in a corner. So if I, if I started with something like that and then came along and said I need to ex needed to expand and I put in another one of those appliances or another two, mm -hmm. where does my new data land and how do you redistribute the data across the nodes to maintain performance, especially for customers that, are, that continue, continue right. to scale and maybe have to deploy, deploy new hardware on a regular basis. Right. So the metadata is automatically redistributed to the system. So that metadata ring is everywhere. The data is placed by policy. So by default, we will not redistribute the object data. Um, you could change your policy to make that happen. But what happens in a large grid is when I make my request into the grid, it's most frequently the case that the, the node that the load balancer sends me to actually doesn't have my object. So it has to do a lookup and then it does a remote fetch. So Storage Grid effectively does remote reads all the time and this works just fine. But so in a large grid when you continue to expand, you may even have nodes that become full. So they're effectively never going to hold any new object but they will hold existing objects and they can still participate in read and write. Um, so what happens if I have a high turnover like in your example here, does that mean that eventually I should just say everything to sort of balance out evenly because by policy you'll redistribute the data to, the new data to be used across all nodes? So it depends on how you do it. So um, again, by default, we wouldn't redistribute the data. We would leave the data. No, in. but if data's been deleted and recreated. Oh, yes, you're absolutely right. And naturally in a, in a case where you have a high, I, I went back to that kind of traditional one where you never delete anything. You're absolutely right. In this case, it would absolutely get redistributed because every 30 days, they're essentially you know, turning over. They're getting rid of 31-day-old data. So in that case, yes, it would balance itself out just because <coughs> of, of the way that data is coming in. And, and so one last question. So if a customer then just put in new equipment up, quite regularly, mm -hmm. is that something that you have to come in and assist them with? Yeah. You know, do you have to help them expand it or do, can they literally rack and stack power it up? Rack and it stack in? power it up. You, you go into the UI and say, I want to go ahead and expand. The expansion gets kicked off. Everything works during expansion. There's, there's nothing where like you can't delete stuff during expansion. The, the expansions and decommissions, all the operations are completely non-disruptive. 